Good morning. We're going to continue on today with chapter 14, Communicating Assurance Engagement Outcomes. Now in chapter 12, we talked about an introduction to the engagement process with planning, performing, and communicating. And planning and performing is what we looked at in chapter 13. So today in chapter 14, we're going to look at the third part of this, which is communicating and really an essential part of what's going on with an internal audit engagement. Obviously, this is not a end of the engagement communication only. It's something that goes on continually throughout the engagement and informing uh, your auditee uh, various issues, anything that may need to be escalated. But this chapter is a little bit shorter than chapter 13, but it sort of continues on that particular case study that we looked at in the last chapter with the purchase to payable cycle and those two issues that we saw there that we're going to elaborate on here shortly into being a part of the audit report and also being part of the informal communication. Uh, so look at page 14.2. Uh, we're looking at the engagement communication, the obligation there. In chapter nine, managing the function, we have a responsibility to report periodically to senior management. Say we as an internal audit department. And communication is always important, right? <clears throat> if you look up at the top of page uh, 14.3, at the assurance engagement process, uh, we see there that... Uh, this purchase to payable cycle we looked at in chapter 13 and also the case study that you worked on for chapter 13, which is the payroll. You know, those two are really what you'll spend a lot of time on in making sure you have proper controls in place. But look at what is taking place there, planning, performing, and then communicating. You know, you're performing the observation evaluation, if anything needs to be escalated. Uh, interim and preliminary engagement. Usually there's, it's just not a once a year, there's usually some preliminary work or mid-year work that is performed in anticipation of the annual uh, audit engagement. But we see here from chapter 13, uh, we have to have specific audit objectives, right? And these have to be tied to our directly to our annual risk assessment and our internal audit plan. We want to make sure that these controls are designed adequately, first of all, and that they are operating effectively. Two areas there that we'll also see here shortly in some of the reporting that we do. Now, obviously, there on page 14, four, the criteria for assessing management's assertions, you know, authorization, validity, you can read that for yourself criteria for the control assertions and also the, the financial statement assertions. So we get to page 14.5 and here this is where we're performing our observation evaluation and the escalation process. COSO there on top of page 14.7 has those three objectives. You have operations, you have reporting, and you have compliance. And each of those three are normally a part of what is written in the audit report. They have a rather detailed flow analysis there, flow chart on 14, page 14.6, exhibit 14.4, about these observations that we have. Um, if the question is there's no observations in the course of the evaluation process, by definition, impact is insignificant, like, likely it is remote. So formal communication to senior management is necessary to indicate no observa observations were identified. Now, if the answer is yes, then that's where you break it out into the three areas, the three objectives that COSO had, right? Operations, compliance, and reporting. And for each of those, and this does a great job of identifying that, is to control design inadequately and is to control operating ineffectively, those two areas, right? And we'll see that in the, in the report write-up on those two observations we had from our testing in chapter 13. Remember those two, the authorization, um, there's 149 sample size, correct? 149 sample size. Well, originally there was 49, they took every third one and doing every third one, which is 40, 49 out of 147, right? 
Out of those 49, there were three, which is about 6%. And so they consider that unacceptable based on their risk appetite. And so they continued on with doing all 147. And in 147, they had seven that were uh, unauthorized. And one of those was still on the signatory list for uh, 18 months. And that's obviously a red flag. And so that was one of them. The other one was the duplicate payments. Remember that? The duplicate payments, which is like $350,000 or so that had been issued in duplicate payments due to invoices that were similar yet different, but the amount was the same to the same vendor. Some of the payment dates were, one of the payment dates was the same. The others were like 15 days apart. And so those are the two that we're going to look at in this chapter here, since it's related to um, purchase to payables and keeping the same flow throughout. Then once you determine there uh, the inadequacy of the design of the control design or the operating ineffectively, then you have to make that determination is it insignificant, right? Or remote or more than significant and more than remote. And you can see that at the bottom page 14.7 with that evaluation map. Right, and the orange up here in the upper right hand corner, that orange there also is more than significant and it's more than remote. So, there you're getting up to something that is significant impact dollar wise, potentially. Although, when you're talking about that authorization thing that we just looked at there with the seven out of 149 were issues. Um, that didn't necessarily have a dollar amount attached to it, whereas the duplicate payments was. But here you're trying to decide if it is it a material materiality, material weakness potentially at some point, which we'll talk about later as well, or just a finding. So back on page 14, six, right? This chart here, about halfway down, we look at what's being insignificant, and if it's significant and material, what do you do? Uh, if it's insignificant, no key controls involved, key controls involved, but adequate compensating controls exist, right? And we'll see that in adequate compensating controls, like on the uh, unauthorized seven out of 149 should not have been allowed to, to make those changes, but the compensating controls that they had were these people were taken off of the system as soon as they exited as an employee. That's usually one of the things HR does in, in combination with IT is remove people. But that doesn't mean necessarily that you updated the database or your report of who actually is in the procedure that can approve, which is a, an issue. As a compensating control is, these people didn't have access to do what potentially you thought they could do. Um, so continue on, I would encourage you to read all of that on 14.6 and that uh, exhibit does a good job of really hands-on how to handle some of these issues uh, through an internal audit. Uh, looking at page 14-8, the risk prioritization metrics. And here we're trying to put dollar amounts um, as far as severity, the impact for the dollar amounts. Most will say 5% of net income is usually what's considered significant. I gave you a link there in D2L. Not sure if I can find it here or not. Uh, let's see here. On materiality thresholds. Make sure I'm sharing the right thing. Yeah, I am. All right, if you come down here past uh, chapter 13, so here, materiality thresholds. Click on that. This is an unsecure link, unfortunately. These financial thresholds does a good job here in this article of defining what is materiality for audits. And they do a good job right here defining that. The most commonly used. Base in auditing is net income, earnings divided by profits. Most common percentage are in the range of five to 10%. 
less than five in material, greater than 10% material, and in between is judgment. There's always judgment on materiality. Uh, but I encourage you to read that article, something to add to the, your learning experience here in this class. But looking back here at page 14-8 uh, in the textbook, you know, they use some large amounts there, millions, um, 14-6 exhibit, and they always relate this in earnings per share, which that's what everyone looks at, right? Their stock price, price earnings ratio. What is that in earnings per share? Millions divided by millions or even billions of shares of stock. But small, medium, large, the impact, the likelihood, what's the impact, what's the likelihood, uh, the frequency there. And then on page 14.9, they start talking about what's insignificant, right? In question has a remote likelihood, slight chance of failing or the impact if its failure is insignificant, right? Materiality, it's not that important. Um, like a capital policy, anything under $2,000, doesn't matter how long the life of the asset is. If it's less than $2,000. If it's 2000, less than $2,000, it doesn't matter what the life of the asset of the object is that you're buying, you just expense it. If it's $2,000 or more and life is more than a year, then you capitalize it. Same type of, there's a lot of judgment on materiality, but it really is based on what you define it as in your policies and your procedure. What's insignificant? What is significant? Right? And then what is material? And that, term it always strikes fear in people's hearts that term material weakness there on the bottom of page 49. That's taken from financial reporting regulations and specifically applies to observations related to internal control over financial reporting and disclosure controls and procedures. The material weakness, and we'll see that here shortly in an audit report I'm going to show you. It's always something that is uh, uh, something that you do not want to have. A finding is one thing. But a material weakness is definitely something that you sit up and take notice. Uh, you want to document conclusions reached as a result of performing these observations, uh, observation evaluation, and the escalation process. You know, exact, Exhibit 14A gives you a template there that we're going to use here shortly. Um, you know, Chapter 13 includes examples of the various steps involved in, in performing these assurance engagements. And we're using books to buy here in 14.9 and 14.10 as well. So looking at 14.9 on page uh, 14.12, this uh, observation here, the outdated dele delegation of disbursements authorization policy, again, what I just alluded to, the seven individual who are no longer with the company, uh, the policy lists these individuals. Additionally, nine individuals were identified who are new to their positions or new to the company. They should have, should have disbursement authority, but are not listed in the policy. So they probably have, doesn't say that, but they probably have access in the IT to do their job. They just haven't updated the documentation, which is an issue. You know, that's what you look for as either external or internal audit, the internal control narratives, list of the authorized folks that can, can do the various functions. And then that should dovetail with your actual IT security that you have on who's authorized to do these, these things. I mean, signing checks is obviously not an IT thing, but that needs to be defined who can sign and how many signatures are needed and at what level. Is one signature enough up to a certain amount and more signatures, two signatures beyond a certain amount. Now, like we said here, uh, looking at the criteria, the cause and effect, um, on page 1412 and that same exhibit 14.9. And they define the criteria. What is the cause? What's the effect of this? Disperses may be made that are not in accordance with management or the board's direction if you're not following your written procedures. Compensating control. Once an employee leaves the company, all access rights to the system are eliminated. So that probably is taken care of. So this is not an issue, but you shouldn't rely on a last stop compensating controls. Uh, a budget to actual analysis, that's always important. We think budgets aren't important, but they are extremely important. 
and controlling your organization, controlling calls, uh, doing actual to budget comparisons. If, if actual is a lot more than budget, are people spending dollars that shouldn't be, which is really more of an issue with uh, these duplicate payments that we're gonna look at here in the next one. But very important. And what conclusion, what, what risk of uh, inappropriately authorized dis disbursement? What risk is there? Is it minimal? And then over on page 14, 13, the last couple or three items in this observation assessment template, you know, the COSO category there, reporting operations compliance. So both reporting and operations have an X by. So those are issues for both those categories. But it's been deemed as being insignificant. It's not a material weakness. It's not even significant or a finding. A lot of people use the word finding in their audit reports. It's said a significant deficiency. A finding. It's neither of those. It's insignificant. The inadequate design was checked there. And... The secondary control, I guess, was in place. The compensating balance or compensating control was in place. So that's just a template that you can use for a material weakness or a finding or something that's insignificant. Then on page uh, 1414 is the observation on potential duplicate payments, right? Instead of the delegation of authority, which was the other one. This one's a potential duplicate payments. And they show there the condition, the criteria, the calls, the effect, which they're showing these examples even before they talk about it, bottom page 14, 15, the criteria, the condition, cause and effect, four areas, very important. They're alluded to on 14, 15 and better defined, I think on 14, 16, yes, on 14, 16. So what's the condition, what's the criteria, and looking at the condition of this, the system rejected all duplicate invoice entries. I already accepted invoices with a digit or symbol was added to the end of an invoice number. So any system's gonna re reject trying to pay the same invoice number twice. It's gonna reject attempting to have a purchase order, two purchase orders with the same number. But what if somebody adds a one to the end or adds an A or some symbol of in order to make a payment, trying to override the controls that are there. That's the condition. The criteria, the receipt of goods or services should be recorded and processed only once. Remember the three-way match, the purchase order, the receipt, when the liability occurs, the obligation, and then when the invoice comes in, you actually make payment. Those three have to be present in order to, to pay one time. So the effect of this there in five is $357,782 was expended inappropriately. Compensating control in this case would be a budget to actual analysis performed monthly by all department heads and call center owners. Yes, that's very important. It doesn't matter if you're in a large manufacturing company or if you're in a small nonprofit. Budgets are important. If people say budgets are just a guideline, they don't know what they're talking about. Budgets have to be met because that's what people have approved. That's what your board of directors has approved or your company or your not-for-profit not that has to be met. If you've got spending beyond the budget, that's a red flag that something's going on there. So this 357,000, it may not have all been in one department. It may have been spread over several, but regardless, you've got to look at that. And so the conclusion is, while the compensated controls may detect very large duplicate payments, there's still the challenge of collecting a duplicate payment from the vendor, right? Also smaller insignificant amounts may be detected, may not be detected. And management agrees the observation has proposed a plan to address the weakness. Therefore, this sort of observation will be included in the final report. It's recommended that AP and this is something that goes on during the audit process. It's not just the end of the cycle audit engagement and then the formal communication says this and everybody, the auditee says, aha, or says, well, I didn't know that and uh, until the end. It should be talked about during the process because the auditors are gonna have more questions for the auditees about what's going on with duplicate payments. Is it intentional? Is it unintentional? what exactly happened. So there is communication, which is what this chapter is about. 
throughout the engagement, not just at the end formally. Recommendation here from the auditor to the auditee is AP should create a query routine that mirrors the test run by the internal audit function and perform it prior to processing each batch. Results of this query then need to be reviewed by the AP supervisor and any payments are identified as potentially duplicative. Those transactions should be removed from the batch and researched before payment. Right, it's not hard to write a program, a query, usually high level, very easy to write. Um, most companies have knowledgeable people in departments that can do a little bit of coding and write reports like that. But it's not just what's being run in that day. You've got to compare the current period that you're running with what's already been paid before to see what's going on there. Uh, and so the management solution, uh, the responsibility is assigned to someone there on top of page 14, 15, it needs to have the person's name and the target date for completion. And the observation evaluation, of this is a reporting issue, not operations or compliance. And again, even though this is $357,000, they've indicated this as being insignificant, that it's not a material weakness or a significant deficiency. It is an inadequate design that the system allows for this to occur. And there is a key control there. And who's this been assigned to? Elliot Nest with, uh, they don't have a date. So again, there, practice advisory 2410-1, we just sort of went through before. The top of page 14, 16, again, criteria, condition, cause and effect. All four of those, very important. In fact, let me share with you something very similar there that I worked in. Uh, Before coming to, uh, there it is. I think you can see that. What you see here is a, let me go back up to the top. This is not an external. This is not an external audit. This is, or excuse me, this is not an internal audit. This is an external audit for First Tennessee Development District back in 2013. I went to work at this company in November of 2013. So this was uh, fiscal year in June 30th, since they are a nonprofit, state funded. They're on the same fiscal year as ETSU and other state agencies. But looking at this audit, it's 76 pages, long audit, isn't it? And these are all out there on the, uh, State of Tennessee Comptroller's Office. Audit report, but I tell you, anytime you get these, the first thing you do, you go down to the bottom, <laughs> which is what? Schedule of findings and question calls. And of course, the auditors report on compliance on internal control over compliance in accordance with OMB Circular A133. Not have to worry about that. But now if we go down to the bottom, find out what's gone wrong. Uh, there's the summary of the auditor's results, um, which I skipped part two, but this is what we're looking at. Section two, financial statement findings. Findings. Um, you know, here in this text, they talked about, and, and they use different terminology. Here they talk about material weakness, significant deficiency, and insignificant. So under findings here, which is really would be considered a significant deficiency, really. Um, general ledger maintenance. During the audit process, the district drafted the annual financial statements and note disclosures, including the schedules of federal and state awards. There was significant improvement in the draft financial statements from the prior year. Our management relied on Blackburn Children's to call who's doing this external audit. It's this company didn't have an internal audit function, although it does, it's just, you have to do that as a part of your job as a director of finance and HR uh, with the three people that you had, 48 people total. So you do have internal audit, it just doesn't have a separate department. But BCS is doing the external audit here as required by law since it's state funded and federally funded. And what they're saying is management relied on BCS to have a significant role in reconciling Justin and general ledger and ensure its completeness. 
very complicated process here for a $7 million company. They have so much funding coming in for so many different uh, state agencies, federal agencies. Uh, it's amazing how much flows through there and how many bits, bits and pieces. And so DCS does a lot of that because the knowledge just wasn't there on site. Um, and of course, this was in 2013 before I was there. It says, in addition, certain financial statements reclassification were required to properly pre to present in accordance with government accounting standards. So the issue here is BCS actually put the statements together more so than they wanted or felt like they should do. And they should be to maintain their independence. They're not the ones to be putting the statements together. Yes, all this was on a QuickBooks type software, but that's great if it's a simple business, but this is not a simple business with having accrual basis on some, cash basis on some contracts, modified accrual basis. It's very time consuming and, and complicated. And BCS has a lot of knowledge there. But the fact they did this, they saw this as being a weak, not a material weakness. They saw this as being a finding. Um, so it says here, the criterion calls again, that's going back to what's in this textbook, similar, right? Condition and context, criterion call, effect. The criterion cause is the general ledger should reconcile to the draft financial statements along with supporting spreadsheets for government wide entries. Uh, general ledger was not adjusted to reflect reconciliation completed during the preparation of draft financial statements. What's the effect? Several significant adjusting entries to the ledger and certain reclassification were required to properly reflect the transactions. And so the recommendation was, you can read it there for yourself. Uh, what's management response? We concur. <laughs> All right, and there's another prior year finding because this is a current year finding, right? Current year. Prior year, because there's always a follow-up every year, controls are regarding ship accounts. That's just one of dozens of things that goes on there. They were a public guardian for people who couldn't take care of their own financial stuff. People in nursing homes and so forth, they didn't have someone um, that was a custodian. And so this particular company oversaw about 20 or so people's financials and personal affairs and so forth. So there were controls there that had been implemented. So they corrected that in this year. There were no federal award findings, question calls. There was no prior year. So current year and prior year of federal award. So that's a big deal when you start talking about federal funding. You go to the next year, that was 2013. Well, I skipped the next year. This is 2015. So I've been there a full year and a half. And again, you always go to the bottom, audit reports, 84 pages. There were no current year findings. We corrected all that. The prior year findings, uh, general ledger maintenance had been implemented. So this was a clean year, thank goodness. Um, no questions about federal awards. And then in 2016, which that's when I left, I left, well, I actually stayed until third week of July to get the books closed, although everything wasn't completed. And when we look at what happened at the end of that year, go down to the bottom, as we always go to the bottom and look, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, and that year, there was a material weakness. Well, the material weakness, general ledger maintenance, that's popped up again, like it had several years earlier, says during the audit process, the district management, meaning this company, First Tennessee Development District, relied on Blackburn Children's and Stagall to have a significant role in reconciling and adjusting the general ledger, almost verbatim what it said before. They're calling this a material weakness, not just a finding. So there must have been a lot of stuff went on there that didn't get worked out because even though I closed the books for the most part by, well, as best I could by the third week of July, because I turned my notice in in May, seven weeks trying to get everything done. You really don't get the books closed until middle of August. And so the person who came in after me didn't really, wasn't qualified to do it. So um, a lot of issues there. And I'm sure BCS sensed that as well, that 
in sort of in disarray, but they should have paid somebody, I guess, to complete the closing process that knew what they were doing. But so they got a material weakness on this. Criterion calls, you can read that for yourself, the effective condition. That's what I'm trying to point out. This is external audit, but they're kind of doing internal audit type stuff as well with what they're doing since you don't have a full internal audit. You don't have an internal audit department in a company of 50 people. Um, you have the controls, you just don't have a department that's looking at this stuff like external audit does. And in management's response there, this is what they said after I left. We concur the closing of the district's books this year was complicated by lead staff resigning, that's me, just before the closing process and audit began, well, which is not true. I did as much as I could, giving them a seven week notice. Does every effort will be made to properly record transaction and maintain the general ledger throughout the year and to close the general ledger in a timely manner in the future? There were no issues with federal award findings. You know, that was, we talked about Bristol, Virginia utilities with all that stuff, people going to prison and so forth. That's why it's such an issue. You start talking about federal funds, that's a huge issue. So that is 20, 16, let's see if I can find 2017 on here. I know the video is getting long, but uh, there it is. You can go out there and find any of this stuff. Of, um, on the comptroller's website, comptroller.tn.gov. Let's look at uh, 2017 search. Or she's going to pull up anything that's in Washington County. Look at all these government agencies in Washington County. Three pages of them. First Tennessee Human Resource Agency. There's First Tennessee Development District. Let's see what 2017 looks like. So this is a year and a little over a year after I've left. Of course, we always go to the bottom, don't we? Look at the reports getting longer and longer. 104 pages. <laughs> All right, so we got a lot of stuff here. And that's from having untrained staff. Wow, I didn't know it was that much. All right, so here we, maybe that's why I went from 84 to 104. Current year findings, material weakness. Again, BCS was doing the same thing they did the year before. Uh, putting all these statements together and the statements are what what is right here under uh, these prior 93 pages a lot of that is put together by it's supposed to be put together by the uh, the district and not bcs or pay somebody to do it uh, the condition and context criteria and calls effect of the condition what does that mean what's the recommendation What's the management response? Every effort will be made. All right, they couldn't blame it on me there, could they? <laughs> All right, then we get into significant deficiencies. I guess they're calling findings all of this. So under the umbrella of a findings, you have material weaknesses and significant findings, and then stuff that's insignificant. Although anything insignificant is not going to be a part of this report. We'll see that here in the text as well as we finish up this chapter. That's usually communicated informally through an email or probably not just through an email, but through a letter. Stuff that's insignificant, it's not, uh, not worthy of being put in here. So anything in this audit report here, even though it's external, really applies to internal, are material weakness and significant deficiencies. So the significant deficiency was something here with Tenachi, Tennessee, Appalachian something. Again, part of it is there's just too much going on in this particular company for the amount of people in the accounting staff. But uh, that's a whole other story. <clears throat> but you can read this uh, as part of the general ledger, the financial reporting of that. Apparently there's something with an agreement wasn't properly recorded. Um, so that's one finding there. 2017-01, because they're going to keep track of it because it'll be on next year's. 01, then the next one is 02, material weakness. Looks like they had some procurement problems, didn't they? Allowed or unallowable cost.
Number three. Tenachi sub recipient eligibility controls over compliance. In compliance with uh, Tenachi, program could not be tested for eligibility. You now we talked about testing, lack of documented controls, direct contracts with sub subcontractors who perform the task of selecting the eligible sub recipients grant based on ARC. Appal Appalachian Regional Commission, that's federal. ARC is federal. Number four, all about Tenachi. That was something that just came about when I left. It wasn't part of 2016, but obviously it was in 2017. 2015, or excuse me, or number five, significant deficiency. These are material weaknesses. These are significant deficiencies. Number six, another significant deficiency. And then here's the corrective action plan from First Sensei Development. So they wanted something more detailed here. Uh, person responsible, finance director, should have that completed by the next fiscal year, right? By the time they get this report, this is in, this report doesn't come out usually till the end of November. So you're already almost halfway through the year. So that's why this is the formal, this is the formal audit report, all 104 pages. But there is communication all through this engagement, it has to be. So these things are being implemented in September, because the audit begins like August 20th, and they usually wrap it up by sometime in mid-October. But there's communication all through September and October. So these things, uh, this corrective action plan here should already be in place by the time they get this formal report, right? Well, they're referring to the fact the new finance director didn't fully understand the relationships. Well, this was completely new anyway. It didn't start to like June of 2016. Uh, I think they did get it all corrected out though, from what I've heard. Finding 2017-01. So every one of these findings has a number and a corrective action, right? And someone who's responsible. And when it's gotta be, it's gotta be completed by the next year. It doesn't mean you just correct it by then and the next 11, next 11 months are incorrect. You've gotta get it corrected now in the current fiscal year, all right? Books are still open. All right, let's go ahead and look and see. This is 20, let's look at 2018. Eastern eight. Or since he's always on the second page for some reason, I don't know why it's not in. There's Bright Ridge, right? Electrical company, power provider, city of Johnson City, library. Everyone is separate entities, right? Separate audits, animal control center. You find out all kinds of stuff in here. First is the human resource. Research found there it is. First Sensei Development District 2018. All right. Oh, it's back down to 95 pages. So that sounds good, doesn't it? Let's go all the way to the bottom. Current year findings. So I've got that material weakness of. Blackburn Children's to God does not like the fact that they have to do a lot of the financial statement preparation, which is in this report. Um,
accounts paid for the trust fund was a little bit more detail here. Let's see what that says. Trust fund was 47,230. That's all I much when we're just talking about millions in this book, right? Again, this is a $7 million a year in revenue company. Um, I don't know what happened there. It's just an error, it looks like. But they're calling that a material weakness. Um, you know, the total cash that they had in the bank at the time, I think, was two or three hundred thousand dollars. So, with that in mind, versus like an Apple that has what, 50 billion or something, <laughs> these amounts can be significant, right? Because this is a break even type. Company. I mean, they they probably come out ahead maybe forty or fifty thousand dollars in a year. So this is significant when you start talking about these thresholds. That's why it's on here is material weakness. It's all relative to materiality. Um, here's federal award findings and question calls. So this is a new one here. Oh two. To Natchi. Oh, this is repeated from prior year audit. I'm sorry. 2017-03. So they've given a new number here. So that one's still outstanding. And so that's good. They cleaned up all the rest of those to Natchi issues. And that's an ongoing one. Uh, so the corrective action here, 2018-01. Material audit adjusting is required to properly state accounts payable. Then there's the executive director. And this is all public information, all right? I didn't mean to do that. There it is. Now you go out there and look at any of this. So um, if we back up to the main menu. There it is. If you just Google, I think I Googled uh, State of Tennessee Audit Reports. Just click on that, right? And then types of audits, find an audit report under reports. And then do your search, do it by county city, select a year. All right, but I want to share that with you because of um, it's important to see how, I know that's an external audit, but they're kind of doing internal audit stuff as well. Things aren't always just completely as a textbook describes. So back on page 1416, I've been going at this for a while, but it's good stuff to see sort of real world year over year, the, some of the terminology that's in this and how they report versus uh, everything's not the same. It's like account titles are never the same from one chart of accounts versus another for companies that you work for. But 1416, conducting interim and preliminary engagement communications. Yeah, they always, internal audit is a year round thing. They would, they would all, when I was at Exide, this was always the first NCAA development district. Well, even at FTDD, they, BCS, they would contact me during the year and ask me questions, or they wanted me to ask them questions. They didn't charge us for it. 
Anytime I ask them a question, they would note that because I'm asking a question, they're going to follow up and see if I did the right thing on that. So that helps them in understanding what kind of risk, what type of issues are coming up. And that's their advice for it. But when I was at Exide, obviously large Fortune 500 company and Lear as well, um, I was exposed to internal audit all the time. And I wasn't at Lear, but three months down Morristown. And I worked with internal audit probably more than anyone until I left there. And that was just, of course, that was leading up getting ready for the external audit with PwC, I think, or KPMG. I think it's KPMG. But internal audit was working independently right out of Detroit with me to make sure that location was in control. Really, I'm control of SOX 404. Um, but at Exide as well, it was year round that they would be asking questions. And oftentimes it's the same questions. They were looking at the same areas that external audit. And, and at times you think external audit was working with the internal audit. They weren't, they were working independently. Right, internal audit is just trying to make sure everything's being done that it should, all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted so that you get a good external audit because that's what's going to drive your, where you get a, a qual, unqualified opinion or not and obviously you have no material weaknesses and you have a good, uh, a good audit re, external audit report that doesn't impact your earnings per share. So 1418, 1419, developing final engagement communications. They do a good job here. We just kind of looked at that a little bit on uh, what I shared there. Although I didn't actually share the actual report. Let me see if I can go back there and find out here at the end. But on 1421, there's the final formal communication of internal audit. The chief accounting officer is directed to from the audit director for books to buy holding corporation everything that they've worked on there. And then on page two, this is enhancing cash disbursement review and approval procedures. Remember that? That was from chapter 13. We looked at here in chapter 14. It was considered insignificant, but it was something included as a part of this, right? Uh, it was considered satisfactory, but the dollar amount there is why it's being pointed out. And then on 14.12, or excuse me, 14-24, is the final informal communication, um, which are for insignificant findings, right? Insignificant. So the insignificant part of this was the, in the cash disbursements process, the delegation of authority and who was on the written list. People on there, one had left 18 months ago, at seven total out of 149 that were listed that weren't even with the company anymore, but to compensating control. Um, that was considered something that shouldn't be in a formal report, but is something that should be communicated informally, as it points out on 1425. This needs to be communicated informally to, whether it's through a memo probably that's attached to an email, or hand delivered uh, and maybe deliver and have a face-to-face -face meeting about it so they understand so that the auditee understands that. So let me go back in because that really pretty much finishes that chapter. There's a summary starting on 1429. I would always encourage you to reread the summary as well before you answer these questions and, and do the case study. Let me see if I can find that audit report again. Let's see, go back a lot of years, right? Let's look at 2020 for Washington County. I think that's where I found this. Hey, it must be under Johnson City. Well, 
So let me pull it up for some reason. Well, I'm not doing state audits. There we go. There it is, 2019. Let's just go ahead and look at the bottom of this one. See if they got everything cleaned up. Yeah. It's like they changed the format a little bit. First of all, down at the bottom is report on compliance for each major program and internal control. That always shows up at the bottom of the page. Am I still recording? Yes. Hopefully I'm sharing that. Let me share it again just to make sure. All right. So this is the audit committee, management board of directors, first entity development district, report on compliance for each major program, management's responsibility, officer's responsibility, um, boilerplate stuff. Of course, they always point out material weaknesses may exist that have not been identified. They also said we did not identify any deficiencies in internal control over compliance that we consider to be material weaknesses. So that's improvement, right? This is from the June 30th, 2019 fiscal year, right? See how late this is, December? Well, this is almost six months after the end of the fiscal year. Uh, financial statement findings, prior year. So that's been repeated again for 2019. Prior year, 2018, that's been corrected. A little bit different format. Summary of auditor's results. Internal controller financial reporting. Are there any material weaknesses? No. Significant deficiencies? Yes. Non-compliance material to financial statements noted, yes. No material weaknesses on federal awards. You're getting a little bit of non-profit and internal audit in this class, aren't you? There's a significant deficiency in general ledger maintenance, although it's not a material weakness as it was one of those years, right? There's the corrective action, who's been assigned. All right, so let's go back up to the top because I completely skipped. big board of directors. These are all the mayors of cities and counties in the eight counties of Northeast Tennessee. A lot of people. There's the independent auditor's report. Yeah, I'll put a, a link up there. If you don't go out there and read stuff like this, you can learn a lot just by looking at these reports. Management discussion analysis, that's what the controller or the finance director I always had to do that because I was only there for, let me do 2014, 15, I guess I just did two years. A lot of bank accounts to reconcile every month. All right, I just thought I would share that with you and I'll put a link up there to uh, State of Tennessee if you don't go out there and look at any agency there is. It's astounding how many government funded agencies there are in, uh, in these counties, right? I mean, three pages of just Washington County Tennessee. But uh, that's pretty much chapter 14. Um, 
be sure and complete the questions and the case, turn that in, and we'll talk again next time and do chapter 15.